Welcome back, everyone, to another Kerbal Space Program video. And, you know, for this week's Kerbal Space Program video, I wasn't quite sure what I should do for a mission. Because I've done a lot of missions on this channel. We're kind of getting to the point where I have to really think hard about, you know, what could I do for a mission? And so I did what any person in my position would do, and that is hit up the scholars that reside on the Matlown Discord server and ask them for suggestions. And so with that, the fair and democratic decision to do an ELU rover mission was decided. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing in this week's video. And as you can see, construction is well underway for the lander and rover combo itself. Uh, I wasn't quite sure what how to interpret the ELU rover mission because there's, there's a couple of different kinds of rover mission you can do in this game. One, you could just send like a curiosity-esque rover to a planet where it will just stay forever and just do some you know research missions that sort of thing then you've got building gigantic roving colonies in kerbal space program again with no intention of returning back to kerbid instead building a big wandering habitat that kerbals can live on forever and settle a new planet and then finally you have a i don't know apollo-esque mission where you just have a lander that has a rover with it but then once all your surface excursions and science experiments are done the kerbals then disembark the rover get back on board a spacecraft and return home i decided to go with the latter if it wasn't obvious already from the setup that i'm building here and that is we're going to have a lander that lands on elu deploys a rover with all the science experiments on it we can then get our Kerbals off in the rover itself and they can go on a little adventure, look for surface features, that sort of thing. And then once they're done frolicking around on the icy surface of Elu, they can get back on that lander can and get back to the mothership, which is what I'm building here. So yes, it's going to involve an Elu orbit rendezvous, similar to the Apollo missions again, where we have a command module left in orbit around the planet and uh, the lander goes down as a separate module and then comes back up to redock with the mothership. So you know, fairly, I wouldn't say complex mission, but there are, you know, little things that make it a bit, a bit, make it interesting, I guess, more interesting than a direct ascent mission, put it that way. And you can see I've kind of got an Apollo style setup here when it comes to transporting the lander to Elu. Uh, I didn't want to have it launch in this configuration with the lander upside down at the top like that, just because A, it would kind of mean that the rocket is less pointy, so it compromises on the aerodynamics, but more importantly, um, I wanted there to be a realistic launch escape system so in the event of catastrophe during launch our kerbals can eject from the top of the stack and survive and if there's a giant lander can in the way that might uh, impair that ability so we're going to have again a apollo style setup where the lander sits underneath that upper stage and then once we get out of the atmosphere we have to do a quick reconfiguration of the vessel to get that lander up to the front of the spacecraft where it will then dock and uh, I guess then the mission can continue forwards. Uh, I like doing this kind of setup because it means that the lander can, can kind of act as an extension of the command module itself just to give our Kerbals a little bit more space. You know, we generally anticipate ELU missions to take about five years in Kerbal Space Program, so they're going to be stuck in that craft for a while. So as much space as we can create is usually a good thing. That's why I've got that hitchhiker storage module below the Apollo-style command uh, a command pod <laughs> at the top. It's completely unnecessary because we're only taking three Kerbals with us, but it just creates a little bit more space for them, makes it a little bit more realistic because in my head cannon, that uh, high, uh, what's it called? Hitchhiker storage module, uh, that just contains like four... Um, what's it called uh, suspension suspended animation stasis stasis pods it's getting close guys i i generally i like uploading these videos on 2 p.m on saturdays um and i usually can do this by making the video throughout the week but i had a busy week this week and so for me it's currently 20 to 12 on saturday so i kind of need to get this video edited and commentated over so to reach the masses and um 
So there there's a, might be some uh, verbal typos here and there because I'm I'm so excited, guys, and also I'm getting a bit stressed uh, at the prospect of getting this uploaded on time. So hopefully it's out on time. I mean, you guys know, right? Because hopefully you're watching the video now, but uh, I don't know at this point. And so there's drama or something like that. Does it improve the video? Who knows? Uh, as for the lower, <laughs> going back to the footage on the screen, as for the lower part of this rocket, I've gone with a fairly SLS-esque, <laughs> say that five times fast, setup, where we've just got that orange tank with a mammoth engine at the bottom, flanked by two SRBs, but I've gone with the ESA skin, uh, not to try and make any political statement, I just think they look better with the ESA uh, branding, makes it look a little bit more interesting, and I guess it kind of dates the video a bit, so you kind of know this came out after 1.10, I think was when ESA parts came out. Anyway, as you can see, we are now on the launch pad, ready to launch. So, um, we are actually launching at an ELU transfer window. I just used the website Transfer Window Planner. I think it's like Alex Moon. Basically, just go on Google and type in KSP Transfer Window Calculator, and it will just tell you on Google. I'll probably put a link in the description so you can find it yourself. Uh, and that just tells you when to launch. For me, it was something like year... Uh, 88 day 272 I I, I don't know but it, it's, it wasn't like the first available ELU transfer window because this is my LAN aerospace save where we've already been operating for a number of years and there go the SRBs I didn't run them at full uh, fuel capacity because we don't need them for the entirety of the flight and I kind of wanted this to have a realistic Delta V budget in that stages are dropped when they run out of fuel so we are going to be doing this on a shoestring budget we're going to be using pretty much all the fuel in the entire rocket including the uh, interplanetary stage so should be fairly interesting to watch you know will I run out of fuel no I won't because um, I wouldn't be uploading the video otherwise but we can pretend right <laughs> um, what can I talk about right now <laughs> <laughs> We're doing our gravity turn. It's nothing special, really. Just really, really gradually tipping ourselves over, being mindful that we want to try and get our apoapsis fairly high using this mammoth stage because it's got very, very high thrust. The upper rhino stage has comparatively lower thrust, so it's going to have a it's going to take a little bit longer for it to continue raising our apoapsis to a meaningful level. So we want to make sure we're at least on track to get into space. And I think we are. As you might have noticed, I've messed up the staging a little bit. My intention was to have those four SRBs fire at the same time as that decoupler, but as I forgot to check my staging, I'm very sorry. So uh, luckily it was a very quick fix. I only had to press space very quickly and it staged correctly. So I guess if I'd kept my mouth shut, I wouldn't have even drawn attention to it. So... Uh, I don't know if there's a moral to this story or what, but as you can see, our burn <laughs> is now done. All we have to do is coast our way to orbit. And once we get very high in the atmosphere, which is about now, we can deploy that launch escape system and indeed the big fairing around the craft. Because at this point, air resistance is basically non-existent and that fairing is just dead weight, as is the launch escape system. But, you know, the launch escape system, we did need to get rid of that because we need to expose that upper docking port so we can dock the lander with the upper rocket. Um, we're not going to do that just yet, though, because we need to circularize. And fear not, that lower stage, you may have caught that in the build time lapse, but in case you didn't, that lower stage has a probe core and reaction wheel and indeed some parachutes so it can land itself and it's not going to just get left in low Kerbin orbit, which is what would happen if we didn't have any of those things because we're going to be circularizing using that lower Rhino stage. And here we are approaching our maneuver node to perform said circularization. I do love using these engines. Uh, I've got to make the most of my time with them because uh, the next part of the mission is going to be using those really, really slow nuclear engines, which have abysmal thrust weight ratio. So you can't really go anywhere fast. So like just making the most of having the Rhino and Mammoth engines uh, whilst we had them. But sadly, their time is done. We now have the nuclear engines. I mean, I do have five of them. So our thrust weight ratio isn't too bad. And the actual mass of that mothership, well, you know, fairly high because of all the fuel. It's not, you know, too bad. You know, there's not a lot of dry mass there. It's mostly just fuel. Uh, I've transported some really massive things in my time in Kerbal Space Program, especially things like EVE landers and, uh, yeah, nuclear engines. They are... They're, 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 you don't really go anywhere fast. But, you know, the flip side is that they are very, very efficient. So, here we are, conducting the uh, the patented Laun Lazy method of docking, where we have a pilot in each of these two ships, and we can just get them to just target each other, and all we have to do is push one towards the other, and the automatic SAS, if you leave it on target mode, 
uh, it just brings them together and you haven't really got to worry about docking. So although I used mono propellant to uh, get that lander can free from the scaffold structure on this stage here, uh, we don't actually need it for the rest of this mission because, like I said, we're going to be doing the, uh, the lound lazy method of docking. And uh, that requires no monopropellant for ships like this. So you can see how that's done when we get there. Got to keep that viewer of retention, guys. So um, that will be happening at some point in this video when we eventually finish doing our surface activities on ELU. But uh, can't get too ahead of myself. We still haven't left Kerbin. In fact, we're going back to Kerbin at a remarkably fast rate because we need to recover this lower stage. Because here at Lion Aerospace, we're always thinking of the space dolphins can't leave junk flo floating around <laughs> in space so we're gonna let we're gonna just deorbit this lower stage here so now we're low enough for those parachutes to deploy we're still going a little bit fast because this is quite a heavy craft for such a small number of parachutes so just before touchdown we're going to quickly fire that rhino engine to do a soft splash down there and as you can see the booster survived quickly pressed recover before it had time to start tipping over and we managed to recover those engines and fuel tanks it was all fine didn't really, obviously it's not essential to have it recover itself and be reused because this is a science mode save, so funds are not an issue. Our theme park business at Lown Aerospace is booming right now. Please watch Velocity Lake. So <laughs> we didn't really have to worry about budgeting, but it's just nice to do it in case anyone wants to replicate this mission in something like career mode. Um, and it just looks a bit better as a YouTube video to not have it just smash into the sea and get destroyed. Uh, it's nice to just say, yes, look, we recovered it. This mission is a very versatile uh, mission, and the craft itself is good. So as you can see, I dragged out the prograde marker on the maneuver maker just there, just to ensure that we were going to get a good ELU encounter, or at the very least, you know, a fairly close ELU separation. But I'm not actually going to be doing the ELU encounter burn in one shot. I'm going to do it over two burns at Kerbin Periapsis because I want to make the most of the Oberth effect, which is that the more time you spend burning at Periapsis, at least when you're performing a prograde burn like this, uh, the more efficient your burn. And so by splitting the burn across two Kerbin orbits means that we can spend more time burning at Periapsis. It's not efficient, guys, to uh, activate the retrograde engines just there on the lander can, so don't do that. Do check your staging like I so very clearly didn't in this mission. Uh, and then we can, you know, I guess that we can just do our first burn. Now, the other reason I wanted to split this burn across two orbits is because the maneuver node maker isn't always that accurate. As you can see, that blue line there, it wasn't a perfect match to the predicted dotted yellow line of the maneuver node maker. And basically, the longer the burn, the more complex the burn, generally the greater disparity between your eventual orbit and the orbit predicted by the maneuver mode maker. And because we want to get this fairly accurate in terms of our ELU encounter, I wanted to try and minimize the burn time as much as possible to ensure that our eventual orbit would as closely match our predicted one as possible. Now, of course, we're not going to get our ELU encounter at this burn because we're not actually on the right inclination. ELU is quite challenging, but not really because it's so far away. I mean, yes, that kind of makes it a bit more intimidating, but the thing that makes Elu a little bit difficult, more difficult than something like Juna, is that it's on this big tilt. So you have to do an interplanetary plane change uh, if you want to get an encounter. I mean, you don't always have to, especially if you're doing a gravity assist at Joule, but usually when you're doing an Elu mission, you have to anticipate doing a mid-course correction burn in interplanetary space. Luckily, it's a fairly cheap burn, we could do the inclination change at Kerbin, but the closer we are to the sun in this instance, uh, the more inefficient the burn. The further away from the sun you are, i.e. <laughs> as the closer you are to solar apoapsis, uh, the cheaper inclination changes are. So this is kind of like the opposite of the Oberth effect. The Oberth effect is great for prograde retrograde, not very good for uh, inclination changes. So you want to try and do inclination changes as close to apoapsis as possible. And here we are making a maneuver node at our sun apoapsis. So yeah, Elu. I was going to say Elu's sphere of influence is very small, but it's not really. Uh, it is in the sense that, yes, it's a very, very small planet. So it can be a bit finicky to get our maneuver node to ping into Elu's sphere of influence. It's much harder than something like Joule. But as you can see, Elu's actual sphere of influence, like our little orbital line that goes past it, 
is quite big. It's bigger than something like, uh, I don't know, a similar size if it were around, I don't know, Juno's orbital height. And that's because there's nothing really near Elu. Like, Joule has a very big sphere of influence because it's an absolutely gargantuan planet. Uh, but Elu's is pretty big as well, and it's very small. But there's nothing really near it to kind of influence the course of a ship. So it's very easy for Elu to have an influence that's a little bit larger than its size might initially suggest. But yeah, I, I do like visiting Elu. It is definitely one of my favourite places to visit in this game because it's not actually as difficult or challenging as it might initially seem to be. Like, it's very, very easy to uh, assume that it's going to be monstrously difficult when you first zoom out on that map screen and see just how far Elu is from Kerbin. But really, you know, when you break it down, all you have to do is add a few more fuel tanks to your interplanetary tug stage and uh, you know, get familiar with the idea of doing this interplanetary correction burn. But once you kind of got those concepts down, which you kind of learn from doing missions to like Juna and Eve, uh, it's really not too bad uh, to go to Elu. And once you're there, it's, it's a nice achievement. I mean, look how far away the sun is. It's a tiny little speck in the distance, which does actually bring me to one point that's very important to remember when it comes to making Elu rockets, and that is that Elu, as we just discussed, is miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles away from the sun. It's so far away from the sun, actually, that solar panels only produce about 4% of their um, relative power they provide at Kerbin when they're at Elu's orbital periapsis, and only 1.4% of their normal power values when Elu is at its apoapsis, because Elu's orbit is eccentric, so uh, its periapsis is much closer to the sun than its apoapsis. Anyway, because Elu is generally so far away from the sun, solar panels are not really a reliable source of power for Elu rockets, so I've loaded this thing up with some RTGs, which obviously provide electricity without the need for Reach, uh, without the need for like solar power or anything like that. So that's what's re recharging this ship's batteries. We're not just like using the infinite electricity cheat or anything like that. Uh, so we've got an RTG on the mothership and we've got an RTG in the rover as well so that the lander can continue to power itself uh, and the mothership can continue to power itself. To help bolster the power of the RTGs, we also have the nuclear engines, which actually also have uh, alternators on board. So when we fire those nuclear engines, they actually recharge the batteries as well. So lots of sources of power for this rocket that don't involve relying on the sun. Although, interesting and fun fact, because Elu is on this eccentric orbit like this, sometimes it's not actually the furthest planet from the sun. Occasionally, it passes in front of uh, Joule's orbit. I was about to say Juno. <laughs> it sometimes passes in front of Joule's orbit, so Joule becomes the furthest planet from the sun. Now, I know that some of you might worry at this point, like, oh, hang on, if Elu sometimes passes along Joule's orbit, is there a risk that the two planets will collide? And uh, do not worry, ladies and gentlemen, uh, because Joule and Elu are on a 3-2 resonance, uh, their orbit, they will never collide, basically. So Elu is safe, it'll always be around, because luckily in Kerbal Space Program, horrific interstellar events are not a risk that we run. Speaking of risks, though, uh, one of the most risky components of this mission is about to begin, and that is, of course, our descent down to the icy surface of Elu. So as you can see, Jebediah and Bob Kerman bravely boarded the lander can just there, and Valentina remains in the command module uh, and gets out of the way because unfortunately, like the Apollo missions, our uh, lander can just there has only got seats for two Kerbals. But Valentina's got an important job. She's going to be controlling that mothership when it comes to redocking these two vessels once, well, once all of our surface activity has concluded. And, you know, she can do other things like maintain connection to the Kerbal Space Center so that we can they can just, you know, make sure the mission's still going okay back at base. And she can do things like preheat the oven, you know, make some dinner that when Jebediah and Bob return, they've got a nice hearty meal to celebrate their uh, their brave voyage down to the surface of Elu, which as you can see is rapidly approaching. I was a little bit worried I'd left it a bit too late to start my suicide burns, so although I'm following the retrograde marker relative to the surface, I did a quick vertical burn just there uh, to kill off our vertical speed a little bit quicker so that we wouldn't end up smashing into the icy surface. Not sure if that was needed actually in the end because we ended up having quite a lot of space between us and the ground once our relative velocity hit zero, but... Uh, it's fine. It's always good to err on the side of caution, especially because I packed a little bit more Delta V than we needed for the descent, just in case we ended up getting near the surface and I realised I was getting a little bit too close to some rocks or a cliff or a valley. Um, we, we, it would be nice to just have that reserve fuel so we could quickly adjust our course and land somewhere else. 
but we didn't need to. And as you can see, touchdown has occurred successfully. And uh, there they are, Jebediah and Bob, the two brave Kerbals, happy with their achievement thus far. But now, of course, becomes the, uh, the, the focal point, the most important part of this mission, and that is performing our actual EVA on the surface of Elu. So the first thing we can do is detach that rover so that they've got some transport and... Uh, I guess there's nothing more else. There's nothing else to add other than just allow the Kerbals to disembark the lander and get on board those two seats. Now, uh, one of the nice benefits of the Breaking Ground DLC is it adds a little bit more uh, of a necessity for having rovers because now with the Breaking Ground DLC, there are surface features that we can go and visit. And as you can see, there aren't really any near our landing site. So now we can use this rover to uh, try and find one. So that's one thing I like about the Breaking Ground DLC is that it really just helps justify bringing rovers with missions like this. I always like bringing rovers anyway because it adds a little bit of challenge when it comes to designing the lander. As you can see in this instance, I had the two uh, landing engines flank the central rover. I did consider putting the rover inside a surface bay, service bay, but those can be quite clunky and it looks a bit like goofy and bulky, so I thought this was a bit more of an elegant solution uh, for this particular mission here. And ah, oh, hark, do I spy <laughs> a, uh, a rock just there? I think I do. So we can pull up towards it and we can deploy that scanning arm and we can we can scan the Elu chunk. Now, don't worry. Don't look at the screen. Nothing to see here. We've just had the, uh, the scanning arm just clipping through that wheel. It'd be nice if those scanning arms could like detect other parts on the vessel and could like articulate themselves around those wheels but I guess it's not a big aim we've got a nice a big chunk of science from that analysis just there and I guess we can I don't know what I'm doing here oh, oh no yes I, I remember now I said it would be nice if Bob come and jumped off and got a surface sample from near the ice rock as well now uh, we've got a surface we've got a surface analysis of an ice rock oh <laughs> Do nothing to see here. <laughs> we got a surface sample from an ice rock, but it would be nice to get a sample from another kind of surface feature. Elu's got a few. It's got Elu bergs, ice rocks, and uh, black rocks, I think. So we're going to look for one of those. Now, I deployed the boom arm because I wanted to do some analysis here, but I realized you've got to be uh, airborne for the boom arm to actually work. So I tried to pick up lots of speed. And then when we got some air, I quickly ran the boom arm experiment. And as you can see, we got a nice analysis of the uh, magnetosphere, I think is what that ana analyzes. Uh, so there's a little <laughs> way I got around. That's how I was able to run that experiment from the rover. Just accelerate, get some sick air, and run the experiment whilst you're airborne. And ah, do I spy a surface feature on the orb? Nothing to see here again, chaps. <laughs> uh, something broke. I think our boom arm broke. Luckily, uh, even if it breaks, you can still recover the science it gathered from it. You just can't conduct any further experiments. So kind of blew my chance at any further analysis with that piece of equipment. But everything else on the rover survived. So I decided it was okay to press on. Because as you can see, I've done quite a lot of driving in this rover. And I haven't really done that many quick saves. <laughs> and uh, I didn't really feel like doing this big drive again. So um, we can continue with our drive toward that black rock just then we can find out exactly what it is is it uh lava or you know solidified lava is it some sort of alien excrement is it made of chocolate who knows we haven't done any kind of analysis on it yet so our kerbals once they figure out how to <laughs> activate the steering of those rear wheels we can maneuver ourselves to get our surface arm within range and conduct some uh, analysis of this rock just here. Now, the first thing I had to do was quickly take the data off that science arm so that we could run it again. And I guess Bob's just uh, maneuvering himself out of the way. There we are. So I'm not going to play this at real time speed like we did last time because you guys have already seen the arm in action. And I want to get this mission. I uh, realize that this mission's been going on for quite a while now. I don't want to keep you guys here any longer than you need to be so we can keep the mission running at a nice quick pace. Um, Bob's now just doing some more experiments because I realized that I've been putting a bit of, I've been putting a lot of focus on that, uh, scanning arm and indeed the boom tower <laughs> just here. But I, I also brought all the science experiments from the base game as well, uh, sans the science junior, which is just a bit too big for a rover of this particular size profile. But we can run the other science experiments now. And Jebediah can conduct a, uh, surface sample extraction near the black rock because Bob has already taken a surface sample, so he can't take another one. So we've got ourselves two surface samples. We've got lots of science. Um, 
We've got a nice view just there. I think at this point I was just zooming out to see if I could see any bigger surface features because you can get some really massive icebergs appear on Juno if you've got the Breaking Ground DLC. And I, I did actually cut out a bit of driving that I didn't include in this footage to try and keep the video as concise as possible. But I did lots of driving, lots of panning around with the camera, trying to find a bigger surface feature to go and visit. But in this instance, unfortunately, I was not successful. We didn't find a particularly large surface feature. So maybe in an upcoming video, we'll have to revisit Elu and uh, make another attempt at finding a large surface feature. I mean, I think uh, one of the main incentives to make me come back to this planet in the near future would be if the next release of Kerbal Space Program, which I guess would be 1.11, uh, if that includes a surface revamp for ELU, then that would be a great excuse to revisit this planet and have another go at trying to find a big iceberg. Oh, graceful, a graceful stop just there. Uh, overcooked it a bit, so what I did was I just got Bob out on an EVA. I just careered him towards the, uh, the the seat. As you can see, it worked a dream, and I noticed actually on that seat that there's a thing that says ejection force, and I wondered what that did. So I just turned it up to maximum, and uh, oh dear, um, it, it turns out it's exactly what it says on the tin. It uh, flings the Kerbals off like that. Luckily, Bob was fine. Uh, he made a full recovery from his massive fall, and he can go ahead and plant our Laon Aerospace flag. Pose for a nice picture for his Instagram profile, and uh, we can type a nice name, which in this case I went with Elu Rover, because I'm not very creative. And there we are. No, Bob, don't take your helmet off. Okay, it was okay. Guys, I got a bit worried there. Anyway, I think that, uh, that's about a wrap for all of our surface activity, so we can get both of our Kerbals back onto the lander cam, which I just did through that crossfade just there, and then we can retract our ladder. I do notice now that the lander is sliding a little bit. Not sure why that's happening. Hopefully it doesn't hit the rover. Although I guess it wouldn't make that much of a difference at this point because the rover mission has concluded, but I don't want it to like hit the rover and then damage its landing legs or something like that um, before we get a chance to launch, which will be about now. So I've got a uh, Apollo lunar module kind of set up where we've got a separate upper stage for our ascent, which is now deployed rather explosively. And uh, spoiler alert, guys, that's not the only explosion that you're going to see in this video. In fact, we're going to see lots of explosions within the next uh, five minutes or so. How long have we got left on this video? Let me just let me just scroll out on my editing timeline. Ooh, about ten minutes left, just under. So yeah, lots of bangs, lots of flashes, lots of explosions. But the first thing we need to do is get our encounter with our mothership just here. Now, because Elu has no real atmosphere, we can accelerate flat pretty quickly, and because its surface gravity is fairly low, uh, we don't have to go too high, as in, usually you have to do a bit of an arc ascent, like you have to do a bit of vertical climbing first before you can really start your uh, horizontal acceleration, but in Elu's case, it doesn't take very much to get clear of the surface, so we can start burning horizontally almost immediately, especially with our relatively high thrust weight ratio in this craft, which is basically just a lander can and an engine, so there isn't really much dry mass to uh, hamper the thrust to weight ratio. Now, I noticed we'd probably be getting a closer encounter on our second uh, intersect node rather than our first one, so I just got those as close as possible, which I think I ended up with a separation of about a kilometer, which is pretty good for an, a body as small as Elu, so I was happy with that. And then once we approach that intersect node, we can perform a retrograde burn relative to our target on the nav ball to uh, basically make ourselves stationary relative to the mothership, and then we can form a burn straight towards our target, which gets us a separation of zero kilometers quick, fairly quickly, and we can line up on the retrograde marker and get ready to stop as we approach the mothership. And, uh, whoop, I overcooked it a bit. I got a bit enthusiastic. I was like, oh, there it is. I got a bit excited, and I forgot to drop out of time warp in time and perform my retrograde burn. So we did create a bit of an explosion very close to that nuclear reactor, but luckily it was fine. A quick uh, ocular pat down of the mothership revealed that there was no damage to the uh, interplanetary ship just there. It looks like the only loss was one of those small fuel tanks on the lander cam, which if we don't really need that fuel anymore. These ships are pretty much together. We can do all of the docking using the mothership now. So we're going to dock in the same way we did earlier, just have both ships uh, target each other's docking ports and hold them together using the auto SAS and as you can see despite the fact that they're kind of rotating relative to each other the docking ports are maintaining perfect alignment and we can get an easy easy dock and there we are back with the mothership now it's very important to first of all shut down that lander's uh, engine but more crucially it's important that we get a Kerbal out on EVA and take the data from that lander cam because that lander cam unfortunately isn't going to survive this flight. It will be destroyed upon Kerbin re-entry. So we want to make sure that we've taken all of the valuable data 
from it. And, you know, less crucially, our Kerbals are off it as well. They've got back onto the command module just there. I am going to leave that Landacan attached, though, just because, A, we get, like, 0.5 meters per second of extra Delta V from the remaining fuel in its fuel tanks. But, again, it provides a little bit more interior space for this spacecraft because, unfortunately... We've got a long journey ahead of us, guys, and how much Delta V have we got? We've got 1,906 meters per second, if my eyesight does not fail me, which is uh, kind of what I was aiming for, to be honest. I wanted to have about 2,000 meters per second of fuel left when it came to getting from Elu to Kerbin, which is obviously nowhere near what we had when it came to uh, getting from Kerbin to Elu. But don't forget, we haven't got to do a circularization burn at Kerbin. We can just use the atmosphere to slow ourselves down using that heat shield attached to our command module, and heat shields in this game are very, very, very powerful. So I didn't need to worry about budgeting any fuel for our Kerbin circularization, so we can blow the rest of our budget on getting a nice close encounter with our home planet. So uh, there it is, all plotted. Fairly big burn. We're going to use almost all of our remaining fuel to do this, but as you can see, as you saw from the map screen, it was going to get us an intersect with Kerbin's atmosphere, so we could do this burn and then detach the upper stage and we would be fine for the rest of the flight. Um... But it's nice to get the engines attached, just because it's nice to have that there for when we finally enter Kerbin's sphere of influence. You can do any last-minute adjustments to our orbit, which actually I did. I think I lowered our apoapsis. Our apoapsis? I think I lowered our periapsis down by a couple more kilometers, because at the moment it's a bit too high to capture properly. Now, the maneuver node maker once again fails me. You know when I said earlier that the maneuver node predicted orbit doesn't always match up what your eventual orbit will be? Well, that happened in this case, so I'm going to have to do some quick manual burns on the nav ball uh, just to get our uh, periapsis to be kind of where I want it to be. Uh, so I, I, I just started pointing towards the various nodes until I eventually got an orbit that I was happy with. So I think I, yeah, I started burning retrograde and then I decided actually it would be nice to uh, enter on the light side of Kerbin, just so you can actually see what's going on a bit more easily. I uh, can see the fireworks a bit better as well. So there we have it. A Kerbin periapsis of just over 40 kilometers. So I think I, I think I eventually wanted to aim for a periapsis of 35 kilometers. So there'd be a bit more air resistance that would ensure that we do actually capture and we don't just exit the atmosphere and then subsequently exit Kerbin's sphere of influence again. Which is another reason to just hang on to that lower stage just there in case we ended up doing that and we could reload a quick save and lower our periapsis a little bit more and then try again. So there we are. Cold Boy is re-entering Kerbin's sphere of influence imminently. We can drop out of the map screen now and just do a quick radial in burn to lower our periapsis to a more desirable height, which I think, I think, if memory serves me correctly, was about 35 kilometers. There you go. Actually close to 36, but it said 35 on the map screen, so I get some credit, I think. And uh, there is Kerbin thoroughly zooming in front of us because uh, you look at our orbital speed. It's over 5,000 meters per second, uh, which is obviously very fast. It looks like, are we going to get to six kilometers a second on re-entry? We might just make it. Although, actually, you know, now we've re-entered the atmosphere and uh, I left it a little bit late for decoupling those uh, unnecessary stages just there. But in a way, it was kind of good because it gave us some great fireworks <laughs> uh, to kind of break up the monotony of uh, interstellar travel. Interstellar travel? Not quite that far. Interplanetary travel. And uh, as you can see, the Kerbals, they loved that show. Uh, we're starting to ascend just here, but as you can see, our apoapsis height is rapidly plummeting. So um, we are going to remain within Kerbin's sphere of influence. We're not going to rocket off back into interplanetary space. So it's a quick job of time warping around to get ourselves onto our second Kerbin entry. And this is going to be the final one this time. It's going to kill off enough speed to keep us in the atmosphere for good. And now that we're getting a little bit lower, we can deploy those parachutes. Eventually, <laughs> there we go, it's a bit hairy, it's like, is it going to deploy in time? And uh, we can detach that lower shield as well, just to reduce the mass of the command module. And now that it's cruising down, I thought, let's make things a little bit more interesting, because it's always the boring part of the mission, isn't it? Just watching the, cro the, the module slowly descend on parachutes. It's always like a bit anticlimactic where you do this big epic mission, then you just sit there like, oh, now the parachutes are deployed. And then you just watch it for like 10 minutes, like... Eventually, it's going to touch down, right? So it's nice to break up the monotony using a Kerbal's uh, personal parachute to do some epic skydiving. You know, Valentina missed out on going to the surface of Elu, so uh, she can make up for that by doing some epic skydiving during our Kerbin descent. And there is Jebediah and Bob arriving shortly after Valentina. She can get back on the command module so they can all be recovered together and we can take a look at the science rewards that we can reap from this mission. 
Show me the money. Show me the money. Here we are. 2,547.5 science points earned. It obviously could have been a bit more if I'd done things like doing science in interplanetary space, but... Uh, whatever, don't really need it, I've got the Tetri unlocked, haven't I? And uh, that's the end of the video, actually, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, there's more on screen, the left-hand side was a video chosen for you based on your viewing habits by YouTube, so I don't know what that one is. Right-hand side is my most recent upload, and like that's it, actually, I think I've said enough. Goodbye.